Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests of Intergeo and members of the media. Welcome to this Intergeo press conference here in Berlin. It is Wednesday and this event is traditionally um, halftime of Intergeo, the leading international expo and conference for forward-looking geospatial applications. My name is Christopher Wirtgen. I am your moderator today. And uh, we have called out a motto for this media event, and this is navigating sustainability through geospatial insights. We all know about the enormous impact that geospatial data today has on decision-making in various fields in politics, administration, and industry, and especially on sustainable developments within these fields and beyond. So we monitor our planet on a global scale to understand trends and patterns of change. We integrate geospatial intelligence into urban planning and development. We build digital twins these virtual representations of real-world environments and spaces to prevent mistakes, avoid unnecessary costs, save resources, and get the right stakeholders on board. Indeed, already a lot is going on, and a lot of great success stories are and have already been written in the context of local intelligence and sustainability. As Jörn Thiessen from the German Ministry of Interior and Community pointed out in this keynote yesterday, we have to make sure that sustainability does not become reduced to a phrase. The topic is too important and far away from losing relevance and urgency. Just last week, the European Union's Earth Observation Program Copernicus reported that 2023 appears on track to be the hottest year on record. Farmers are threatened from severe droughts. We've seen the pictures of wildfires. We've seen the pictures of floodings. And uh, these were just a few of the dramatic events we already had this year. And when the 28th UN Climate Change Conference starts in Dubai on the 28th of November, and this is in one and a half months, one does not have to be a prophet to predict that the findings will not be much different from those of the last one. Many countries stay far away from achieving their climate targets by 2030, namely limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial age. Even more, the latest UN report predicts a rise by 2.7 degrees Celsius by the year 2100, for an intermediate and up to 4.4 degrees Celsius for a high emission scenario, if no decisive countermeasures are being taken. So let me formulate a maybe naive sounding question. Should we not be able to navigate sustainability more better and more efficiently regarding our ability to capture, analyze, and visualize geospatial data and in regard of the valuable insights we gain out of them. So the foundation for decision-making seems better than ever before, and I'm thrilled to have distinguished experts here on stage to talk and to discuss about this. We will talk about innovations, we talk about best practice, we talk about challenges and strategies, hopefully, and afterwards, media representatives um, will have, of course, the opportunity to address their questions to the participants. So, now let me introduce them to you and let me start with the host of this event. I welcome Professor Rudolf Steiger. Since the beginning of this year, he is president of the German Association for Geodesy, Geoinformation and Land Management, also die Gesellschaft für Geodesie, Geoinformation on land management, so viel Zeit muss sein. And the DVW uh, is host of Intergeo and the organizer of the Intergeo conference. 
And Professor Steiger is also an expert for international correlations in the field of surveying because he led the FIG, the Fed International Federation of Surveyors, as president until last year. Welcome, Professor Rudolf Steiger. Thank you. Uh, hang on. I welcome Godela Rosner. She is head of the Earth Observation Department of the German Space Agency at DLR. The DLR, das Deutsche Zentrum für Luft- und Raumfahrt, is the National Research Center for Aeronautics and Space in Germany. And the German Space Agency at DLR coordinates all German space activities at national and European levels. For example, Germany's contribution to the European Space Agency, ESA, and the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, OMITSAT. Happy to have you here, Godila Rosner. Please welcome, uh, I now go to the other end of uh, the queue, please welcome Boris Skolpiak. Um, he uh, represents today Scott Crozier, who could not make it. Boris Skolpiak is Vice President of Trimble Survey and Mapping Strategy and Product Marketing. So it's correct, isn't it? Yeah. And the Serving and Mapping Division um, of Trimble uh, facilitates high-quality productive workflows and information exchange for surveyors, engineering, and GIS service companies, governments, utilities, and transportation authorities. Trimble is leading uh, a leading technology company that specializes in providing positioning, connectivity, and data analytics solutions. And Trimble is also a platinum sponsor of Intergeo. So great that you join us today, Boris Skolpiak. <laughs> so I welcome Gerd Butzig. He is business relation executive of Esri Germany. Esri stands for Environmental System Research Institute. It was founded in 1969, and it specializes in geographic information systems, software, and location intelligence solution. Also, platinum sponsor of Intergeo, welcome Gerd Butzig. <laughs> and I'm happy to welcome Thomas Haring. Thomas Haring is president of Hexagon's Geosystems Division and CEO of Leica Geosystems, part of Hexagon. Hexagon is a leading global provider of sensor, software, and autonomous solutions that are efficiently connected in the form of digital reality. Also, Hexagon is a platinum sponsor of Intergeo. Good to have you here, Thomas Haring. Thanks a lot. All right, and before we take the deep dive now into navigating sustainability, I'd like to ask Professor Steiger, as president of the Organizing Association, for a kind of a halftime statement. So, Professor Steiger, um, this is your first Intergeo as president of DVW. It's not your first Intergeo, of course, but uh, how does it feel so far, personally? Thank you very much, Christoph, for this question. Indeed, it's my first Intergeo as president. My first Intergeo as, pre as person was in 1985 when it was still called Geodetentag, and it was in Düsseldorf at that time. I am proud to be the president of DVW and I'm proud to be the host of this conference. We are really overwhelmed about the current situation here. Berlin and Intergeo is a story of success. Intergeo is here for the fourth time, and every time the figures are increasing. You all know Intergeo is not only an exhibition, it's also a congress. And after Corona, you always ask a question, is this still the right concept? If I look at the figures, it is still the right concept. We have increasing number of registrations for the exhibition but we have also increasing numbers for the Congress, especially the Congress increased by 29% on the national level, 
and 88% on the international level. This indicates us clearly this is the good concept to combine Congress and exhibition together, also because our systems are becoming always more complex and they need more explanation. So I can make a statement, thumbs up, good. That's a great entry, and um, for the uh, Congress, you chose the motto, Inspiration for a Smarter World. So, what was your intention, uh, and why does this world need inspiration? Well, this, need in uh, this world needs inspiration. We see a lot of challenges, climate change, the sea level rise, etc., etc. If I just talk about the natural hazards, and if we take the motto, Navigating Sustainability, through geospatial insights. Let's take the United Nations goals. 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators. In engineers like us, we love this. 232 indicators, if you want to describe and, and make figures out for these indicators, more than 80% of them are related to geodata. Without geodata, you can't do this. You can't even describe what are, where are we with the sustainability goals. And you can't check the increase, you can't check the performance. What I want to say is we are needed and we are a kind of backbone when it comes to sustainability. So, in your work groups, uh, you have plenty of work groups. Um, could you give us an insight um, where there are, um, where you foster sustainable developments um, to the uh, geospatial community? Thank you for this question. DVW is not only organizing this conference. We have eight working groups. We have uh, additional fora, which they are promoting what we do. We are working on BIM and Digital Twin. We are working on all different kinds of things we need for increasing sustainability and bringing the planet better forward. So uh, there are a lot of things. I don't want to go too much into detail, but we have very well in focus the benefit of the society when it comes to our professional activities. Thank you, uh, Professor Steiger. And um, I would like to turn to uh, Godela Rosner. Um, you were hosting uh, a panel or two sessions at the conference yesterday. Um, so how was InterGeo for you um, uh, since, uh, uh, right now? Yeah, thank you, first of all, um, for inviting me and uh, just to this press conference and this, uh, this question. Uh, so Intergeo has been um, very vibrant for me. So it's, it's full of, um, it shows the full um, potential that we have in geoinformation. And it was, uh, I was very happy that we had Earth observation as a focus topic in the uh, conference, but also in the exhibition area. Because I think we see already there's the wealth of uh, information that we gather from Earth observation that is essential to understand and to navigate through the challenges that comes with the climate change. You mentioned the highest record temperatures we see this year, not only on land, but also on the oceans. And I think what, what well, the, the big challenge is there will be so much dynamic on planet Earth that will affect our whole life. It's not only the natural uh, ecosystems, but it will affect also um, how we secure uh, our, our food supply, how we secure our energies, uh, how we manage uh, water supply, if the, if the droughts are constrained. This has um, impacts on the infrastructure, infrastructures from the streets and the, and the railways are affected through climate change. So there's a whole lot of uh, ch changes that will appear in a dynamic we haven't seen before. And Earth observation is key to get a better understanding on the spatial dimension, on the dynamics, on the processes. It gives context and is really a, an essential data to integrate 
in our yeah, understanding of, uh, of the planet and of the resources we have to manage. So I was uh, very happy and I, I have the impression there is also great interest. What I hear also from other exhibitors on the field of Earth observation, there are a lot of visitors, national, internationally, that have already uh, a clear understanding on the potential and what to find out more, how to integrate this information into their solution. So that's Great, um, please. The German Space Agency at DLR, um, uh, and you of course, you support research institutions, you support companies and public authorities um, in Germany using Earth observation for decision making. And how does this support look like in uh, praxis, in practical terms? Well, in, in practice, uh, well, one step is of course to inform about the potential. So. One step was uh, to do that at Intergeo, but in, 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 in a very practical sense, I think it's always in terms of projects, in terms of very concrete uh, questions and solutions that are, um, that are needed and to work on that. So, for example, we support um, also um, uh, public institutions and enterprises to find solutions how to ensure that water quality, for example, in the cities is uh, very good, that we can manage the, uh, the raising temperature, the rising temperatures in the cities to, um, to optimize the climate in the, ch uh, in the cities uh, by ensuring that the vegetation is uh, in a very good state. So there are a lot of uh, very concrete questions that are being dealt with in uh, projects where people work together and get a better understanding on what is the need and what can we do with, uh, with our data and with the information systems uh, to find solutions. Are these projects, um, um, are they all German projects or um, do, do you have those projects Europe-wide? Because uh, here at Intergeo you have a booth together with uh, ESA, is with that right? ESA, yeah. exactly. So, um, as I think all the, all the topics, all the problems in the world, we are not uh, dealing on a, only on local grounds, but it's all globally connected. And of course, well, we support on a national level through national budgets we get from the ministry. Of course, that's a very um, important pillar for us. But we also cooperate with the European Space Agencies. There are uh, programs also from the European Commission. There are international bilateral corporations to ensure that uh, knowledge is also transferred to other countries to learn from each other and find the best solutions. And we have to think of if we want to manage, for example, um, how we get control on the emissions of greenhouse gases, like methane is a very powerful uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, there are aspects that you can do um, on an international level by combining all the satellite data that is available, but you have to do it also in a harmonized way, otherwise you cannot, you cannot compare apples with pears. So. Uh, it's, it's a huge interest to get harmonized information and therefore this exchange with other institutions is important. And we try also to support such projects with ESA and, and other institutions. Thank you for the insight um, of your work. Um, can you all understand uh, it properly or can we have the monitor volume a little bit up please? That would be great. So, T Thomas Haring, um, how's been Intergeo to you so far and to uh, Hexagon? It's, it's always great to be in Berlin because Intergeo, Geospatial Industry and Berlin have so much in common. A lot of different routes, a lot of legacy and it's changing. And I think that's what Berlin does, that's what the Geospatial Industry does and the Intergeo. And we are proud partners of that. I arrived at a well-functioning airport, arrived here without a traffic jam. And then I, when I entered, I was extremely surprised, positively surprised about all the excitement and all the, um, the engagement and the discussions. And yesterday, the only problem I had, I was running out of time, had not enough time for discussions. And then I was too tired in the evening to enjoy the big city. So, and the same happens today because there's so much going on. You said the conference program, which is fantastic. I would love to be in much more presentations and listening to them and learn from that. 
I discussions with our customers to learn about sustainability and many other things. And it's always fascinating what different applications we are all doing and what we sometimes don't know or don't market well enough. So one thing is what we always say in these exhibitions, after these exhibitions, we are doing so many good things, we need to just talk better about them and, ex and explain better what we are doing. So, so do we need a 10 days intergeo instead of a three day intergeo? Sorry? Do we need a 10 day intergeo instead of a three day? No, I'm too tired. <laughs> the older I get, I can't do that more than three days. So what awaits us at uh, your booth, Thomas? So I think we are known, and you mentioned uh, that I'm responsible for the Leica side of things as well. We are known since over 200 years for sensor technology, providing accurate data. And we continue. That's core of our business. We will do that for the upcoming decades as well, that you can count on our devices no matter where you are in the world and no matter what the data you want. Whether it's coordinate, laser scans, imaging technology, or whatever, you should count on our data. Of course, we make our sensors more, more mobile. You see that as well, because that's why we have, besides the overall hexagon boost, a boost for especially autonomous solutions that you can take our technology on robots, you can let our sensors fly and these kind of things which I would really like to encourage you to experience. Because we would like to make workflows easier for our customers that they can do more things in a much more faster way. Because one of the biggest limitations we are seeing is labor shortage in the industry. It's not only about accuracy of devices, it's really how can our customers do more and can use all the experience in the office and maybe use devices in the field with people which are doing different things at the same time. And then you can experience software, which we have done for many years as well. Um, and then one thing which we are extremely proud of, and we have launched a lot of different applications on our geospatial platform, which we call HXDR. You can't buy a platform, but you can get all the applications on top of that, which are really use cases for different applications. On reality capture, if you lose video videogrammetry solutions, you can do something um, for operations. Or if you just want to have data transfer between different instruments, you can lose our technologies. And that's what we are striving for, providing use cases, collaboration platforms, tools for our customers to make their life easier. Always open to third party as well, never being closed. <laughs> um, according to uh, your uh, this year's Hexagon um, Autonomous Tech Outlook survey, you're doing this uh, regularly, um, more and more construction firms worldwide are turning specifically to autonomous technology to uh, mitigate and manage their various challenges. So will an autonomous future automatically be a sustainable future? That's an interesting question which we debate. We believe yes, because we see so many things going on. If you automate things, if you work on productivity, if you work on safety, it has a positive impact. But we should not neglect that we should have a po special focus on sustainability efforts as well. And maybe how I best articulate that is, for us, sustainability is not something which we're doing aside from the normal course of business. If we look at a decision in our company, and the same holds true for our customers, we look at time, cost, quality, and sustainability. And that's basically how it is. In the decision making, you need all the different criteria, and they need to take a conscious decision based on the criteria. And that's why sustainability and an autonomous future being more automated, having much easier, much faster, much more repetitive workflows is something everybody strives for, with all the challenges we have in infrastructure, in construction, to get it done like that. Uh, can you provide some specific examples to showcase this impact of uh, autonomous technology on sustainable developments? It's, um, and I'm now, um, we are an asset owner ourselves because we are building a 50 meter tall high rise building in Switzerland in one of our locations. Now I don't sleep so well anymore because I'm used to um, justify innovation projects, do M&As, but we are not building buildings ourselves typically and constructing them. So we are now discussing about how to design it, how to have green engineering with these kind of things, how to really take care of operations during design phase, how to then together with architects, the different engineers to really think about what kind of sustainable solutions do we need to consider. And it's not only how many solar panels we put on the roof, it's many different things, which is interesting if you think a bit about the decisions. And then it always comes back to data and how we use the data and how the data are prepared for us. And that's something where the concrete examples come from, talking to our customers, working with them on these kind of things. And it's whether it's a building, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's a whole city, 
where we can um, do urban planning together with our customers. That's the things we are doing, which you can explore in our booth, and there are endless examples of that. But of course, we always should be reminded we should do more on that. Thank you, Thomas Haring. And I'd like to turn now to Gerhard Butzig. Um, how has Intergeo to you uh, been so far? It was uh, quite a surprise, I guess, that you have to turn up here at the press conference. So, so is it on? It's Can on. everybody hear me? Can you hear me in the last row? OK, thank you. So uh, yes, first of all, two remarks. I'd like to thank the DVW to organize this big show. You're giving, you're giving uh, to our industry a face. And it's all about geospatial information here, information systems, sensors, uh, real-time, near real-time data. And that is amazing to be a part of it. So thank you to DVW and also to the Intergeo people. They made an amazing job to keep this running. That is really great. And we were yesterday surprised that the first day of Intergeo was so flooded by people and guests coming here like during the past years the second day was. And today it's much more than we had in the years before and that is great and that shows the demand on geo-information because geo-information is everywhere, it's around us. You can't get rid of it, otherwise our globe wouldn't exist anymore. And uh, I guess the people get the value of geo-information. So last night I was joining a, a ceremony of the Architect Organization, which is the Academy of Technical Sciences here in Germany. And uh, Walter Steinmeier, the president, spoke about geodata. And he said, hey, we spent a lot of money in Galileo systems, and we always had to convince the policymakers to give us this money. And today, we have the best position coordinates worldwide by, geo, by, by Galileo satellites uh, combined with others like GPS2. And uh, that means to me, that what we all do is in the heads of the policymakers on top of our political system here in Germany. And that is great. With DVW and other associations, we fight for that since decades, and now it is there. And uh, what we show here on the show is how to, how to turn data into information. And last but not least, the map whether it's interactive or static or dynamic or 3D or 4D, is a fasted information media to get information into our minds. And with the colleagues from the public organizations delivering reliable data, authoritative data from the, um, from the, from the, from the private industry, yeah, we are able to shape a digital earth. So for instance, I have a little application on, on my, my phone here, and you can follow in 3D where the International Space Station is recently, right now. And you can see much more than the astronauts from the space, because we can, can superimpose a heat map of the oceans worldwide. So you can see what's going on there. Not everything is seen in top topography. Something is beneath, like the borderlines between uh, countries and continents. And so that is all there. And we show on our booths how you can handle all this and turn it information to have the best possible communication to decision makers, policy makers, and others. And that is, as the colleagues here on stage mentioned already, it's on the desktop, it's uh, in the cloud, it's in enterprise systems, it's homogeneously, it's interacting. And it's the basis, at least for data spaces and digital twins as well. And uh, when you have in mind that more than 70% of the population in Germany is living in cities, then we have to try to solve the climate change problems there. There we have to start. And that is why digital twins are so important. And uh, so we show how a network of different digital twins is interacting and how you can get a holistic view of all those information just to have a 
uh, let's say, the almost best answer to a complex question. Questions. That is what, what we do, in short, in brief. Um, in an article um, I, I read um, that uh, Mr. Schumacher wrote together with Jack Dangerman for their Tagesspiegel. Um, they were talking about two projects um, concerning building resilient cities. And uh, they mentioned projects in Prague and Zurich. Maybe you, you can give us some insights um, yeah. uh, out of those. Yeah, I would like to start with Prague in, in Czech Republic. So, so Prague is an is an old. It's an amazing. It's an amazing city. I, I guess most of you maybe went there for a visit or so. There are a lot of old buildings, but there are also a lot of pavements. And uh, the population in Prague suffer from heat islands, for instance. And uh, due to European law and the carbon neutrality until 2050. Uh, the decision makers in Prague tried to figure out how to change that and they made a very simple thing. They applied a geographic information system, GIS, and uh, first they generated a layer from the, from the Copernicus satellites to identify heat islands in the city. That was the first thing. The, seventh, uh, the second thing was the integration of a layer from the statistics department about population density. And this, that gives some insight where you have to act because uh, when you have a high population density, maybe also with older people living there, and you have a heat island, then it is, or heat islands in that uh, quarter of a town, then it's very dangerous because uh, they get a collapse or whatever. And uh, the third thing they did they get all the documents from the urban planners, what they can do in those areas and what they not can do. And so they started to grow up new parks and plants and greens around there with the water fountains on the rooftops to get a more, uh, to, to get a void of these heat islands. And that is what they did in Prague. Very simple thing, three layers, and you get more insights. So it not always have to be very complicated. It's just a matter to get access to the data, right? That is one thing. And now Zurich? So it's a project that, that is now still running and is, is this continuous. Yeah, yes. It's, is this it's, what you call the living, or which Mr. Dangermont yesterday called the living yeah. digital twin? Yeah, it's a, it's a, at least it's a, a very special digital twin, which is interacting with others, let's say, from the environment. And it's uh, still living because it's interacting with the real world or a real quarter of the town to get um, an update and maintenance of data in a certain sequence when population differs or when you see that your action is positive and the heat, le heat uh, islands are shrinking, then you see that it is working. And that is like a living digital twin because it's synchronized to that's what going on out, uh, out, uh, outside, yes. That is an example for that, and it's a running project. And in Zurich, it's, Zurich is a long customer of us. They come up with a 3D city model, and they simulated the noise uh, coming by cars and, 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 and the surface of the streets and roads, and modeled it in different height levels. And then they made a, si a simulation uh, how it would be in, let's say, 2030, 2035, if you change all, um, all, all, all cars by, by electronic vehicles. And you see that the noise level decreases. And uh, when you change the material of the roads, it decreases much more. And that, uh, that is what they did. It's uh, Zurich 4D. And uh, that is one thing. The other thing is the city planning over more decades into the future. And everybody can understand it because it's a 3D interactive environment. You, have, you can figure it out by yourself and just uh, uh, Google Zurich 4D and you will find a lot of information, official information from Zurich. Great, very interesting. Thank you for the insight. So, Boris Skolpjak. How was uh, Intergeo for you so far? 
As a European living in the US, uh, it's great to be home. So really nice and uh, thanks to, to the organizer for putting such a phenomenal show together. Uh, it, it's great to see Europe in the center of leading these initiatives. And, and what, what excites me about Intergeo every year is, is seeing our international partners and customers. So here I'm seeing audience from Latin America, from Asia Pacific, from Africa. So it's really world coming together and, and a great topic or great challenge you're posing on us to thinking about sustainability, right? So when we think about sustainability in Trimble, right, so it's very complementary to our DNA and our core values, right, of, of trust transparency and accountability all go together. A lot of us started in the surveying world for the, for the love of the outdoors, right? And just kind of taking care of the nature, it, it, it comes naturally to, to all of us, right? So, so uh, uh, I, I think the, the accountability piece for me means it's not somebody else doing the research on how much ice does polar bear walk on, right? So, so how do we, all play an active part in the, in that sustain, sustainable future and taking care of our environment right starts from us how we behave at home how we behave at work uh, from Trimble perspective from, from the technology standpoint our job is to provide our customers uh, and our ecosystem of, of users and partners tools to be accountable right so, so access to technology is still very difficult, right? So, so not everybody can be an e-cognition expert or not everybody can be a, a programmer, a rule set developer, or not everybody can ac get access to a $100,000 piece of scientific equipment, right? So, so we have been hard at work of, of making the technology much approachable and much easier to understand, access, train, scale, right? A and, and bring the geospatial in, in parts of the world that was not accessible or not as easily accessible as before. All right, now you've already answered my second question. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, Scott Crozier yesterday, he had, a, he had an opening keynote at the, uh, the, the conference, the conference opening, and uh, it was titled Trust, Connect, Transform, Unlocking the Power of Geospatial Data. So, um, what role does trust play uh, concerning data? Is that data you won't trust or you can't trust, or am I understanding it completely wrong? Yeah, the, like, like Mr. Haring pointed out, right? What, 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 what we bring to the industry collectively here, right, is, is the, the confidence, right? It's, it's uh, geospatial as professionals. Congratulations. You, you, you picked a phenomenal industry to be in because we are the link of the where, where the physical and digital meet, right? We are the, the custodians of, of that information, right? Location is a critical attribute, maybe one of the 50 attributes, but location, time, and cost. So location comes, comes at the forefront, right? So if you don't have the trust in the location, the other attributes fade in, in, the, in, the, in the confidence level, right? So, it is important that, that uh, as an industry, we, we, we take an active role. Like we have a phenomenal opportunity to, to be not, not just now a geometry experts, but truly really the data managers and help connect the disciplines and industry, right? Because we are the, the trusted link between uh, where those worlds meet, right? So, so through all the, again, technology and solutions, we provide, we need to ensure that remains the case, right? So, so that, that we continue bringing or, or making technology so easy that, you, again, not everybody is a trained diploma engineer, geodesist, right? So how do, we, how do we do that job easier for those, all of those environmental scientists, all the archeologists, all the, all the ologists, you name it, right, can, can interact and, and participate in the process, right? So, so examples from us, Solutions are Trimble Catalyst is a phenomenal example of a hardware as a service, uh, uh, something that people can get on an on-demand or, or as a uh, as pay-per-use basis. So you can keep a, a piece of antenna that you can hook to your phone in your glove department in a car and pull it out when you need that trusted, accurate, fully reliable information you can you can rely on. 
Um, so it occurs to me hearing all these um, or, or seeing all that is already there and seeing all the potentials and the solutions that lie right on the table. And this is why I want to come back to my uh, first question, which, well, in the essence probably means shouldn't we do better uh, in regard of the challenges we, ha we are facing. So um, I want to open up now the um, discussion and um, maybe just, sh shouldn't we do better? I, I think it's not a question of doing it better. It's a question of, first of all, what are the goals, what are the targets, what are the needs? That's the first thing, to identify what do we need. The second thing is, what are our tools we have? What are our technologies we have? And on the technical side, we have to identify the technologies. We have to learn how to use them in coordination with software and to find solutions. At the end of the day, yesterday, Jack was saying, we have also to explain in an understandable way to the decision makers to use this information what we are doing. So we should, maybe it's not a question of better, it's more a question of focused efficiency and effectiveness. That's what is needed from my point of view. I would really like to uh, <laughs> agree and, and uh, I, I could not agree more that I think a, a very important part is how we communicate what is already at our hands. I mean, there's still a way to go, but there are already so many people, so many institutions working on sustainable solutions with all the data, all the technologies that are at hand and that will evolve even more. But it's important that we do not forget how to communicate and do it in a very efficient way that it really reaches the policy makers, the top level, that have to set the, um, uh, the, the basis and, and the, uh, the conditions that we really can transform our society into a sustainable one. So that has to go together and I think we have to keep working on this communication to focus that we really reach that goal altogether. Um, yeah, um, j j just one, one more question. Um, you advise people to use geospatial data, so in the data journey, you're, you're, you're before the solution, is this right? So you, you are the observer and the collector. You mean in the sense of the role of Earth observation? Yes. But Earth observation is already all the way integrated, so all the system integrators that are working in solutions, they are, so it's, mm, it's already there, but it has to be also this, uh, the results that we get, what we see on the, uh, what effects are taking place to communicate that to the policy level, but maybe I understood your yeah, question. Yeah, no, 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 that's perfectly right, but um, what I want to know, is it a question of, um, of explaining to which means communicate or is it education and maybe um, when I started 20 years back at Leica I heard in my first years the surveyor saying nobody knows what a surveyor is doing except if he doesn't do it anymore and that triggered somehow um, over the last years over the last decades I think we made transparent what the geospatial industry does and if you now talk to senior executive at many different um, companies organizations we, they understand the power of geospatial data, which is different. It was our job, and it's still our job, to make it easier, more digestible, more easier to explain, that they are not afraid of the data it's by itself, because we all see data lakes, whatever we want to call it. So it's really our job to make it easier, more explainable, make the workflows easier, make it more scalable. That's something we aim for. And then, of course, we need expertise. It was said before, we need expertise. At the same time, we need to democratize the technologies that many more people can use it and not afraid of the technology. Where the overall industry did a great job over all the decades. Yeah, Intergeo is a good example for that. If I remember Intergeo 20 years ago and now, it's different. It's different, but the core is the same because the core is accuracy precision. And then maybe on sustainability, what we simply do in all industries as Hexagon, being it manufacturing, being it um, process industries, we try to extend the asset life cycle. 
whether it's a mine which is maybe 80 years, a building which is 50 years of old, which is I don't know how many years or tunnel. So extending the asset life cycle. Even that we like new construction, of course, a lot, but we like to extend it as well. And that's something where we need to be a trusted partner over that life cycle. And that's where measurement data can help to do that. Because if a harbor can run 10 years longer before it needs to be renovated, that's something which really has a value, a huge value, and is really sustainable by its nature. So that's something we need to do. And there's so many things we can do more. That's why we at, as Hexagon are never satisfied and are always impatient because we want to do more. So to navigate sustainability from, from, from our background, it, data is just the beginning, you know, and the end is communication. And we emphasis on communication between organizations, working groups, have this paradigm of collaborating and sharing to, to spread out the word, so to say. And uh, the important thing is, I guess, to navigate sustainability, to uh, get to smart decisions, also on a political level. But there are so many political decisions that sometimes avoid to be more sustainability than we could be today. And that is a problem. So uh, today we are able to using AI to uh, make an analysis of texts and documents and uh, foreign trade agreements. And you see how the industrial nations, we all, are related to deforestation in South America, in the rainforest. And we know all that, and we have to take this into account to make a world more sustainable. And that needs sustainable thinking and sustainable decision, a little bit less pure political decisions. As you are, just, one, just one little question. As you are um, from Esri, Germany, so did the very famous called out Deutschland Tempo, uh, did it accelerate any developments? So, I guess, for sure, we should accelerate it a little bit. We should do and apply and bring into practice what we can do right now. And uh, so, all the experienced and very skilled colleagues in the associations, organizations, are working very precisely on doing concepts. And then, some, a couple of years later, this concept has to be put into practice. But today, so our people are more working on a scrum basis, they are more agile with sprint technology or sprint met methodology, and I, I guess we should apply this more in a, in a political discipline as well. And then, then having good use cases makes other organizations follow doing the same, and they come up with a portal and sharing the data with open uh, interfaces and so forth, and, and then the world is going very rapidly more, more digital. So don't have a fear to do that. Try and figure out, and if it is gonna worse, just do the next step with other things. Hope you heard. <laughs> yeah, I think the panelists did a great job touching on all the critical elements, right? The political, economical, social, technology, and so on, right? Uh, I mean, don't, don't have to talk about the politics like the, the, the U.S. is example of a reality TV show, right? It's, it, it does swing a lot of how people and, and, and the general community think and act on, on these topics, right? Maybe one thing to add is, is uh, I, I like numbers, so I, I, there's a saying like, you cannot improve what you cannot measure, right? So I, I think we all work good with goals when we have deadlines, like puts pressure. Right. I, I think it's important that we, we set some targets for ourselves. I love hearing uh, uh, of, of KPIs and, and targets that are setting. So for, from Trimble perspective, we, we, we are making it a habit or a practice. We, we are issuing an annual sustainability report that's very data-driven, that, that provides forecasts and commitments that we need to stay loyal to, regardless if the political or, or other elements change. Right that we don't deviate from this path, right? So, so, so that, that's gonna be important, right? That we don't just get excited about the next, next hype topic that comes along the cycle. So, so let's, let's educate uh, and commit, right? Because once you say something, you have to deliver.
right? So, so uh, that let, let's use this momentum and the environment we are in now to, to, to really commit. Thomas okay. And I'm not sure whether some of you have been here last year when we talked about sustainability at the press conference. Um, I talked a little bit about water and Egypt. And we had discussions with many, many industry, ministries and to create digital twins to do something. But policymakers are sometimes slow, for good reasons. But then you can start with smaller things. And that's something we are trying in our company. We're trying with customers. So uh, we use detection technology, ground penetrating radar, to take water leakages to see where the pipes are, to really do that. It does not solve the overall problem of water in Egypt or in Cairo. But at least it's one step. It's a smaller step. And there are many smaller steps that you can all do we should influence policymakers, and we should never give up. But there are so many things we can do on a daily basis. We can start right away. And that's the excitement, what I see with all the workflows, all the solutions. And what we always say, um, innovation will remain our tradition. I think that's key for Intergeo as well, that we always be innovative. Yeah, we, we keep our tradition. But what I really experience in that industry is that people makes a difference in that world of technology. And that's something I like so much that we all as people as a, can do the difference and go out and do something because we can start right away. We don't need to wait. Um, Professor Steiger, um, how, how do you as an association um, can do collaborations with the industry or with the geospatial industry um, and initiatives um, to foster the adoption of geospatial insights for sustainability? How can you accelerate the impact? What can you do? What would be your role? Thank you for this question. What we can do and what we try to do is, first of all, we offer a platform. Intergeo is not only a trade show. This is also a platform of exchange of information, experience and ideas. And if you, if you go around, everybody, we all can make an analysis on our own, what will be the trend for the next five to 10 years. And if you go around, you see buzzwords like Earth Observation, Smart City, BIM for Infrastructure, Digital Twins, and so on and so on, satellite services like Copernicus. Earth Observation, for example, is not new. This has been done 30 years ago, and it was called remote sensing. But nowadays, data are open. Everybody can do it. You can buy data, data are free due to the European data policy, etc., etc. So th these are the trends. What we can do, we offer this platform. We try to keep it independent. We offer in addition a Congress where you can also explain and, and talk about all this. I think this is, this is our main task. And of course, we are a facilitator. If it, if it comes to the real global challenges, climate change, etc., etc., There is only one world, and I like your question about trust. And I think you should add to this trust, collaborate. Trust means, on a lower level, trust in a technical sense. Is my data corrupted? Do I have a virus afterwards on my computer? But it goes on a higher level. What about the ethical trust of the data? How do I use it or how do I abuse it? And then when we come to the politicians and to the policy makers, maybe the technicians who are here, <clears throat> we should maybe work closer together and make common initiatives. Thank you. Please. Uh, what, a, what, a, what about the idea to have an Intergeo 30, uh, 365 days a year, 24 by 7? A virtual Intergeo where we can all put our applications in and use cases in to show how we fight against climate change, how we tackle this issue, and how we, how we do that, just to provide ideas to the people outside, want to get to know how we do it. And not everybody can come here, it's, uh, but they can follow us on the, on the web right now. And, and so Intergeo 365 could be an idea to have all those materials on the web and with clearly use cases, for instance, like a climate uh, resilience uh, portal we set up with NOAA in the US, where you can see how wildfires, droughts, inland flooding, coastal flooding arises, hurricanes, 
um, uh, and so on, and you can watch it in nearly real time. And that is one step to navigate through sustainability a little bit more, to have this information at disposal, to make everybody know about it, so that they can act and react to the current situation. That helps a little bit. So, Intergeo 365 can start right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this idea. Okay, um, with uh, time in my mind, uh, we need to slowly get to an end. And as this is a, a media conference or media event, I'd like now the representatives to uh, post their questions. I think we have somebody with a microphone coming to you. I don't know. We tried. We just tried. So, are there any questions uh, from the media? This is your chance. All right. <laughs> Somehow expected that. <laughs> it's always like that. So, um, maybe we've just dealt with everything in a very comprehensive way. And um, probably I could say that you are here for a while and if somebody wants like an individual speech, so this should be no problem. So I'd like to thank you very much for uh, your attendance today and uh, for, your, for your input. Um, that was very um, interesting. That was, uh, had a lot of impact, I think, on many people. So, um, and I, of course, thank you for joining us here today, for your interest and presence. And I wish us all another one and a half days. It's still one and a half days, so it's not the end. It's we're just in the middle. It's the second half. It's the second half, which is in most of the cases more interesting than the first half. <laughs> like in soccer, it's the yeah. second half. So there's no overtime. There's no overtime. Yeah, another. <laughs> another uh, one and a half days of inspiration and um, it seems like we need it and so take care and goodbye thank you very much thank you very thank much you. thanks a lot thanks